Wow. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that, Eileen, Lou, and thank you very much to the AOA, to the Aquarian Organization of Astrologers for having me here this evening and welcome to everyone. And I'm so super stoked and super happy to have each and every one of you here sharing in this virtual astrological space with me this evening. And uh, it means so much because I'm seeing a lot of new names of people who I'm not that familiar with. And I also see a whole lot of people who I am familiar with. I was saying to Eileen early before we started recording that there's a, an oraculos, um, <laughs> there's a, an oraculos wave happening because many of the people here are students over at my astrology school, Oracular School of Astrology. So I just wanna say already, I feel very welcomed and very honored to be here. And Eileen, definitely you get, you get, you know, full marks on, <laughs> on the bio. And yeah, I can only do one thing and that's my consistent claim to fame. And that is also the hill that I will sacrifice myself on because for me, I'm a, I'm a one shot, I'm, I'm a one trick sort of pony. And my one trick for the majority of my childhood as well as my young adulthood has been giving readings. I had the great fortune of entering astrology at the age of 12 years old. And I was speaking with a colleague and a friend of mine, Judith Hill, about the same thing. And she said that that was around the same age that she entered astrology as well. And I think I was speaking with Lene Van Horn and Lene was saying a similar thing about, about this uh, primary astrological contact and how the age of 12 is oftentimes an age where a lot of people really come into their astrology or some more expanded body of knowledge, i.e. it's a Jupiter cycle. So, so I came into astrology at a very young age and one of the benefits for that for me has always been that I've never, I've, I've never had to navigate the concept of learning how to trust in astrology as an adult. And I think that this is a very interesting and a very significant point. And I do assure you there's a slideshow presentation, so it's not just me rambling, but I, I just wanted to start off with this. This is a really important point for me. And the reason it's important is because I had this primary astrological training in the trenches, giving readings, making mistakes, screwing up, learning from those mistakes, and really navigating what a concrete version of astrology was. At Oraculos, our basic program is called Foundations of Classical Astrology, and then the next program up is called The Practice of Concrete Astrology. And everything after that is practice of concrete astrology one, practice of concrete astrology two, practice of concrete astrology three, and it goes straight up because this concept of a concrete astrology is very, very, very important to me. And as I was coming up as an astrologer, it never occurred to me that astrology should be something other than a concrete art or other than a concrete skill to have. And so this evening, what I'm going to be sharing with you is this talk and this workshop essentially called Traditional Approaches to Psychological Astrology. And the reason why this matters so much to me is because there's this concept within the wider modern astrological framework that traditional astrology does not have within itself the, the depth to speak about the psyche in a rich and in an enriching sort of way. And this always struck me as strange because it is emphatically untrue. And a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of reading and a tiny bit of a Google search to any of the traditional astrological texts that we have will show that this is untrue. In the medieval period, this searching for the psyche was called the search of the soul, essentially, or finding the soul of the native within the chart. And as we move down throughout time, we find that this term soul became altered to ultimately being what we consider today to be the psyche. But the soul for the medieval astrologer represented this non-tangible animating force that allowed this bodysuit of flesh to be something far more than just the flesh, the bones, and the sinews that allow us to be who we are. 
So when we speak about searching for soul and psyche within the chart, we're essentially asking ourselves one question and one question alone. And that question is, who has this chart? Who is this person? And by virtue of who has this chart and who is this person, how does this person respond to the influences that are imprinted in planetary terms within the body of this chart itself? Our astrology, if we, if we render it down to its most basic definition, when we speak about astrology as a natal practice, astrology is the telling of the life of a person in planetary terms. And the life of a person fundamentally is hinging upon the existence of that person. So this workshop traditional approaches to psychological astrology essentially seeks to find the person who is living within the chart. Because from a traditional perspective, we have to find that person first in order to know how that person is going to interact with the other elements of their natal promise. Now, just a note about li language and term terminology. Just a note about language and terminology. This concept of promise is one that was very much prevalent within our astrological past. And it's also something that was prevalent, I dare say, as deep as the 70s. The natal promise. What is the natal promise? What is it that the chart promises? And as we moved into the later 20th century with the rise of psychological astrology as a specific field within itself and then offshoot of the psychological tradition, this, this concept of the natal promise, it, it, it was an uncomfortable concept for, the, for the, the burgeoning psychological astrology because within the context of a psychological system of astrology or a human-based or humanistic system of astrology, this concept of having something promised within the chart seemed like too much. <laughs> you know, it, it, it didn't take into consideration the free will that we, as particularly Westerners, are so deeply invested in. The concept of me creating the landscape of my own life me as the center of my own universe, and me holding some immutable and unalterable seed of power from the center of my life experience. And so the term promise, i.e. natal promise, became shifted into the term natal potential. And I'm not a potential sort of person. I also have a very fixed sort of chart. And forgive me if my opinions also come from the heart of a double Taurus, but this concept of, of potential is one that is wide and it's vast and it's beautiful and it's nebulous and it's nondescript. And one of the things that we find within the 21st century as an argument against astrology is that astrology is nondescript. Astrology does not say anything with any great level of definition. Astrology does not put its foot down and say things as they will be, but it always gives these wide latitudes that can cause anything to mean anything. And this is, the, this is what we find coming from the skeptics of astrology in terms of our practice, that it's too wide, it's too fuzzy, it's too vast, to be specific for the life of anyone. And it's for this reason why one of my primary expressions of astrological pursuit for myself has always been traditional astrology because traditional astrology has never shied away from putting its finger on the pulse of specificity. And I think that it's something that we can bring back into our astrology to great effect, even if we don't consider ourselves traditional astrologers. What does it mean to practice an astrology that is specific? What does it mean to practice an astrology that defines things in concrete terms? What does it mean to practice an astrology that is unambiguous, that is not vague, and that puts its finger firmly on the pulse of specificity insofar as our own astrological abilities allow? These are questions for us to consider within our practice of astrology. And these are questions for us to consider of the spaces that we learn astrology from. 
because insofar as we are creating a generation of astrologers who will hopefully be able to have some skill set or some prowess to be able to stand up in the skeptical forays and defend this astrology, not through words, but through the demonstration of their practice and through the demonstration of their practice abilities, then we need to be moving in a direction of specificity within our astrological field. It has done it before, in the past, throughout astrology's rich ancient history as a practice. It has always been a field of specificity and a field of speaking to the natal promise that is the fundamental fuel for the lives of people. And we're poised on a place where astrology has the ability to do the same thing again, which is why at Oraculos, one of the things that I hold near and dear, and one of the things that I instill within my students is that it is better to be wrong than to be ambiguous. And if you move within your astrological practice with that level of clarity that I trust this astrology so strongly that I would rather be wrong with something that I say than to be ambiguous, then what we find is that it causes you to have to pull on more knowledge, more skill, more ability, more, more of the craft of astrology from within yourself in order to speak from that space of clarity. Because even if you are not necessarily correct in terms of what you're saying, what will happen is you will more often than not land within a field of truth that still resonates for the person who you're reading for. And this is important, that we're able to land within that field of truth. Nothing can essentially promise to be 100% accurate, but we can get pretty damn close. And the beginning of getting close to anything that even resembles accuracy within our astrological field is knowing who we're speaking to and being able to find that person within the chart. So without further ado, let us begin this evening's presentation. What you will need this evening is a chart. <laughs> like that's the first thing. All right, everyone. So here we have it. This is traditional approaches to psychological astrology with Michael A. Bryan. What is astrology? We opened this already in terms of saying previously that insofar as the practice of natal astrology is concerned, our astrology is the telling of the lives of people in planetary terms. And this is a really important thing, this concept of the, of the chart being the life of a person in planetary terms. And it's important because in the 21st century, we tend to hold on to an astrology of signs and an astrology of placement. Everyone knows what it means to have their Venus in Gemini. Everyone knows what it means to have their Mars in Capricorn. Everyone knows what it means to have their Sun in Scorpio. No one is really knowing what it means to have their Sun in a Sasquatch quadrate with their Mars that is in the quincunx relationship with their with their Saturn that's also having a semi square with their Moon. You know, we, we, we tend to gravitate more towards the placement of these things in my chart are here, here, and here. But this astrology of dynamic interaction and this, this, this astrology of planet-to-planet -planet contact is something that we find very important within the lives of the ancients. And it's something that we're trying to revive today. And I think we're doing a good job at it. But, you know, that's the whole point. We need to move back towards an astrology of planet-to-planet -planet interaction. So... What is the skill set of an astrologer? Luke Dennis Broughton, in his book, The Elements of Astrology, published in the year 1898, says, the more successful an astrologer is in delineating the personal description and also the mental qualities, temper, and the various traits or characteristics of the persons and their liking or inclination to any particular science, trade, or profession, the more successful does the astrologer become and the better he becomes known as a person qualified for his profession, his or her. And this is from Luke Dennis Broughton. I love this. I love this because this represents a portion in astrological history that was still caught up in specificity. And to a large degree, our astrology 
was astrology of the same nature until we entered into the 60s and 70s, the 80s, when we started to do other things with our astrology. And those other things aren't necessarily right or wrong things, but, or and, those other things changed this level of specificity and it turned it into something else. And we're not going to have a discussion about what the else is because astrology is wide enough to hold any inclusion into it of anything. But at the same time, we're wanting to move back to this specificity. So he says, the more successful an astrologer is in delineating the personal description and also the mental qualities, the temper and the various traits or characteristics of the person, then the batch of that person becomes known as a person qualified for their profession. This is the first thing. Who has this chart? So where to begin with this? The first place to begin is we need a rubric. And what a rubric is, is a systematic way of doing a thing. I do say to Eileen and to my students that I can only do one thing. And I do believe that to a large degree because I know how to, I know how to follow instructions <laughs> and I know how to follow a rubric. And what I've found it, as, uh, within astrology to a large degree today is that it is a very vast field and vast in terms of there are many ways to enter a chart. There's even books written on entering a chart. There's a book called Getting to the Heart of the Chart. I think that's the, the name of it. So there, there's many ways. And this has always been a question for the upcoming astrologer. How do I begin? How do I start? And the reason why this has always been a question is because it isn't that the chart has too little information. And this is a Robert Corey quote. I'm saying who it's from because I don't believe in stealing people's information or stealing people's quotes. So what I'm about to say is a quote from Robert Corey. And Robert says that it's not that the chart has too little information, it's that the chart has too much information. So when you see a chart and you see the entire thing splashed out in the front of you, the, the first reaction for the neophyte astrologer is to become overwhelmed because where do I start with all of this? Some people start from the sun, some people start from the moon, some people start from the ascendant, depending on what period of time you're coming from. Maybe you start from the moon and Mercury, maybe you start with the ruler of the chart, maybe you start with the nodes, maybe you start with Pluto, all of these things. And it's not a matter of which one is right, but it's a matter of can you choose one and can you work with that one? Because when you choose one way of approaching anything, what happens is, you become skillful, you become proficient, and you become fast. These are the things we're looking for, to become skillful, proficient, and fast, and to do something that usually takes two hours and to be able to do it in 10 minutes. And I dare say that we cannot develop that sort of speed if our methodology is changing each and every time that we practice. But once again, this is just my very fixed Torian opinion about the, about the world. And it's my opinion after spending the last 17 plus years of my life reading for many, 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 many people. So the rubric that I teach at Oraculos, which is what you're going to be receiving tonight, is a rubric that allows you to find the primary motivation of the native. Native is the word that we, is, that we give to the person who owns the nativity, and nativity is the word that we give to the chart. I say this because I've spoken to astrologers who are not knowing that this term nativity doesn't only have to do with Jesus being born in the manger, but the word nativity is also, the, 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 the word nativity means the story of the birth of a thing. So your natal chart is the story of your birth and the way in which your birth crystallizes the potencies of planetary influence within the context of your entire life. So that is what your nativity is. So for every nativity that exists, there is a native and you are the you within the universe that your chart represents. And insofar as that's the case, we're searching for your primary motivation. The term primary motivation comes from Zoltan Mason, who I dare say found the term from Jean-Baptiste Mohan de Villefranche in the 17th century. And primary motivation is the astrological lifeblood of a person. What is a person's reason to be 
stated in astrological or planetary terms. Traditionally speaking, we find this through an assessment of the ascendant and all the astrological factors occurring within or to the ascendant and its ruler. So the rubric is first of all, we identify the ascendant, i.e. we identify the ascendant degree. Next, we take a look at planets in the ascendant. Next, we take a look at aspects to the ascendant. Fourth, who is the ruler of the ascendant? And as we know, the ruler of the, of the ascendant is also called the charge ruler or lord one, i.e. The, the lord of the first house. And five aspects to the ruler of the ascendant. This is our rubric for finding the native within the chart. And this is our rubric for dealing with this concept of identifying the soul and the psyche of the native within the chart. So that's what we are going to do this evening with the chart that Eileen give to us. So Eileen, my dear, would you please be so kind as to go ahead and give us a chart to look at? Yes. Um, okay, for, first, for? okay, sorry, let me just change this. So first of all, I, I, am, I am, you know, color averse in so far as charts are concerned because the reason why these colors even became a part of anything astrologically speaking was to aid in the process of interpretation and to aid in the process of aspect spotting. So wherever you saw two blues in different parts of this of the chart, you knew that you had a trine. If you saw two greens in different parts of the chart, you know that you have a you know that you have a trine, you know, that sort of thing. Two yellows, you know you have your trine of the air signs and whatever. I, I'm, I'm a really, really, really stoic person in so far as what this looks like is concerned. I don't use aspect lines. I don't use an aspect grid. And I mean, I'll just show you one more thing just for the sake of showing. Um, <clears throat> is it coming? Yes, it is. This page here, this beginner's page, it breaks my heart to no end in astrology, because astrology is so much more than looking at this box down here and saying that as a result of this box down here, a person has no fire and a lot of air and a lot of water. Just being able to interpret what this box means in so far as I'm concerned, isn't astrology. That's you knowing what fire means, what earth means, what air means, what water means, and being able to mash them together to come up with something interpretational. But this isn't, this box is not it. Knowing that this person has 13 planets above and one planet below also isn't it. You, you know, like, and, and I'm saying these things because these things shouldn't be a crux for your practice. These things shouldn't be the crux upon which your entire practice is built. This box over here also shouldn't be the crux. As I'm saying this, I'm getting very claustrophobic because this is too much. This is altogether too much stuff. And truthfully, we don't need it. And so, insofar as for me and my body and my school of students, our charts, for the most part, always look like this. And then even further, uh, we take out this color scheme and we go to all black. And we take that out and we go to all black because your ability to interpret the chart shouldn't come from having colors on the page. It should come from you having that within yourself. And you could send me your complaints later. All right, Eileen. Yes. Sorry. Sorry for calling your name in that tone of voice. <laughs> I, I just forgot we're not in class. <laughs> All right, so Eileen, this is AOA and the chart, this is AOA number one. Give me the date. Okay, so we have March 3rd. 3rd of March, uh-huh. Oh, happy Nin later birthday, whoever. What, say, sorry? 1994. 1994, time? 3.38 a.m. 3.38 a.m. We love times like that, please. Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Fitchburg? Yes. Fitchburg. 
I can't spell Massachusetts for shit. I just want you to know. M-A-S-S-A-C-H-U-S-S-E-T-T-S. That's it? Wow. Yeah. I got it. Okay. And, and male or female? Um, do you want to know? I would love to. Okay. I think female. Okay. Okay, and if it's if it's not, I mean, we could have that conversation later. All right, so here we have the chart of this person. I'm also going to open up a Word document just because it's a positive thing to do on the side of this. So what I'm going to do now is this setup that I would do every single time whenever reading a chart. I technically, personally, would also have the declination table on the left side of the screen. And just because it's an important thing to look at, people sleep on declinations, and I don't know why, uh, but that is that. So this is our basic layout. So the very first thing that we've identified within our rubric of the ascendant is we identify what the ascendant is. So let's just do this together. And if you wanna do this on your own piece of paper so that you can have this as a thing that you would have done, then by all means, be my guest. So, <clears throat> uh, where's my thing? So we have AOA chart number one. So the ascendant is 14, degrees of Capricorn, 48 minutes, period. This is the degree of our ascendant. This is the ascendant degree. 14 degrees Capricorn, 48 minutes. That's important because the degree of your ascendant is a very potent personal point within your chart. And it's important for us to have that, that rootedness there. Now, the very next thing that we're going to do if we are following this rubric is we take a look at the planets that are in the ascendant. So the planets that this person has within their ascendant are Neptune and Uranus. Neptune, we could just do N-E, U-R, oh, A-O-A, yes, just save that to desktop. Neptune, Uranus, and it's in the ASC. The degree is called the A, the degree is called the ascendant. Technically, the ascendant is the degree, and technically the house is the first house. Technically, the descendant is the degree, and technically the house is the seventh house, but it's become ubiquitous that we call the entire first house the ascendant. This is the entire midheaven, the whole house, when in fact the midheaven, the MC, is really just that degree. Uh, and the I see the Imam Chaley, Imam Chaley, Medium Chaley, those are the degrees of those things. And it's not Coeli, it's Chaley. So the planets in the ascendant, Neptune and Uranus, and this Mercury technically is not in the ascendant because there is a five degree rule within traditional astrology. And I dare say, I think it's bled over into modern astrology as well, that if a planet is within five degrees of the next house cusp, that planet is not necessarily in the house and the same sign. So if a planet is within five degrees of the next house cusp and the same sign as the next house cusp, that planet is in the next house. So this Mercury is at 22, which means it's within five degrees of this 25 degrees of the second house cusp. That is something that we are all knowing. So we only have Neptune and Uranus in the ascendant, and that is a wonderful thing to know. Uh, now, the next thing that I technically look at is the declination table, because like I said, people sleep on declinations and they shouldn't. And here on the declination table, we see that this person is having their ascendant, that's the AS ascendant, is at 22 degrees south, 37 minutes, 22 degrees south, 37 minutes, which means the ascendant is south in relationship to the equator because declination is measurement north or south of the equator, just so you know. So the ascendant is 22 degrees south, 37 minutes. And what else is close to that? Well, hell, Uranus is close to that. Uranus is 21 degrees south, 35 minutes. And that's what we call a parallel. 
we have Uranus parallel ascendant, which brings out this Uranus even more importantly, or it, it highlights the importance of Uranus even more so within this person's life. So you might take a look at this person and feel as if this person is a Capricorn and all of the wonderful, you know, firm, stable, structured, ambitious things we might say about Capricorn, but this person is really having a very powerful Uranus overlay, which says that this person is weird. And the weird is just one of the Uranus words that we might use. Another Uranus word that we might use is that the person is revolutionary, the person is rebellious, the person doesn't necessarily want to be confined within the structures of society and all of the, the Uranus things that we might say. But then there's some more stuff there as well because whenever you have one of these outer planets having a parallel or contra parallel relationship to your ascendant it isn't just a matter of who you are but it's a matter of things that occurred within your environment the ascendant is created based on our local horizon the midheaven is created based on the moment in time based on our local meridian so the ascendant having this relationship to space to the environment says that the ascendant refers to who you are as a result of the environment that you're in one and secondly things that happen to the ascendant aren't just things that happen to you but they're things that happen to your environment so what we see here is ascendant parallel the uranus is saying that disruption was a fundamental part that this person found within their environment. Disruption, breaking apart, radical separation, all of the ways in which Uranus causes things to crack open for the purpose of freedom, but also for the purpose of deep change that doesn't really allow the environment to feel very stable. Those are some of the Uranian uh, things we can say with Uranus parallel the ascendant. The environment that I grew up in was also weird. And here I am as a card carrying weird person as well. It's nice because weird people make great astrologers. So that is that we have Uranus. So in terms of the DECL declination, we have Uranus parallel to the ascendant. You need to go in your own chart, go look up your parallels and contra parallels and see if you don't have your whole life rearranged by it because it's a powerful, wonderful, amazing thing. So that's that. Now, the next thing that we have is, so we did planets in the Ascendant. Now, this one is aspects to the Ascendant. At Oraculos, we practice what is known as rapid aspect spotting. And that's one of the first things you learn. Your second week of studying at Oraculos, you learn how to spot aspects, which is unheard of in a lot of places because people learn aspects usually as a last thing. But aspect spotting says that, rapid aspect spotting says that you hold on to that degree of the Ascendant and you rapidly zoom around the chart and look for other things that are having that same degree or degrees close to that. Now, this brings us to the topic of orb. Whose orbs to use and how big an orb do we use, period. So orb sizes. I'm a tight orb person, the tighter the better. So we have hottest will be from zero degrees to zero three degrees hotter will be from zero three degrees to zero five degrees and hot is from zero five degrees to zero seven degrees this is my our oraculos orb situation hot hotter hottest these are the orb sizes that we use. We're very tight orbed people because if a chart is going to say something to you, you don't have to use a wide orb for it to be said. It's going to find a way to say it. So those are orb sizes that we're using. So we know if we have something between zero and three, it's hottest, zero, three to five, it's hotter. Why is that a zero? That's a full. Or five to seven, it is going to be hot. So 14, I rush around the chart. Mm, it's in the ascendant, so I don't really have to pay attention to those. I know that signs directly next to each other don't necessarily have an aspect relationship because they're signs in aversion to each other. We don't use the semi sex style in traditional astrology at all. So I'm going to ignore anything in the, in the Aquarius or in the Sagittarius, and I go on. So 14, ah, I have this lovely sun. I have a sun sex styling the ascendant. That is worth noting. Aspect. I have my son, son is 60 to my ASC. 
This is how we write that at Oraculos. You have sun 60 to the ASC. Why? Because my keyboard doesn't have a sax style symbol and 60 is the sax style degree. And that's why. So sun 60 to the ASC, what else do we have? We have the, we have the Venus. Where does the Venus fall? 23 degrees or rather 14 degrees to 23. That would be six to the 20. And then that would be nine additional to get, or that it would be nine degrees in total. So do I really wanna use that Venus? It's really not my strong suit. So I'm gonna move beyond the Venus and see what else I see. Power to fortune is a non-factor in so far as this is concerned. The node is a non-factor in so far as this is concerned. In traditional astrology, we don't take trines and sextiles. We don't take soft aspects to the nodes. We only take the we only take the conjunction to the nodes and the square of the nodes because the square of the nodes is a very important place called the bendings. So the bendings, if a planet is at the bendings of the nodes, then that planet is particularly important. As we see here, this person is having Mars exactly squaring the nodes as well as Mercury exactly squaring the nodes, but we won't bring it up because that's not what we're looking at this evening. But just so you know, in traditional astrology, we take the squares to the nodes and the conjunction to the nodes, not the trines and the sextiles to the nodes. We move on. The Chiron is doing nothing to my ascendant. It's too far. The Jupiter, the Jupiter is 14, 14 to the ascendant. That's a sextile, which is lovely. So we have Jupiter. <clears throat> we have Jupiter is also having a 60 to the ASC. We have the moon at 25. The reason why I, why I will include the moon is because it's the moon. And the moon as a factor has a wider orb in the same way as the sun has a wider orb in general. I will take this moon to the ascendant. And also because the moon is conjunct the north node and also because the moon is angular, I will take the moon to the ascendant. And if that is um, a thing of confusion, you could let me know. Eileen, do you, are there any questions thus far? Not yet. Okay, wow, that's okay. So we have moon. What was I saying about the moon? We have the moon at the 60 of the ascendant. And then we have the moon node connection. I'm going to make a note that that is a moon node, moon north node. I could put NN because I mean, um, I'll put the NN for the north node even I'll put the NN for the North Node. So this person has a Moon Node connection. This person also has the Moon Pluto connection. Now that becomes important. Even though that Pluto is too wide to the Ascendant, that Pluto is very much close to the Moon because the Pluto is within three degrees of the Moon, is it not? So by virtue of the by virtue of the Moon being so deeply complected or connected with the Pluto as a standalone factor, the Pluto gets drawn into the Ascendant. Pluto by itself at 28 degrees would be altogether far too wide for the purposes of what we're doing. But by virtue of the Pluto being so close to the moon and the moon already being tied into the ascendant, we're looking at a moon Pluto ascendant story, which isn't that far from what we said initially about the early environment of this person being, you being Uranus. You know, the, the Pluto is also having a similar effect and the moon Pluto is definitely also having a similar effect. So we have moon and Pluto in the 60 to the ascendant. And then that's pretty much it in terms of aspects of the ascendant, yes? So this is what we set up. This is what we do every single time. And the reason why we do it is because this serves as a meditation. As I'm speaking you through this, I'm already building a composite image within my mind about who this person is, period. As a standalone factor, who is this person? That image is already starting to be built in my mind and so that's why we do it because it's like creating a mandala, creating a work of art. You're picking up things as you go through the process. Okay, now the next thing that we have, so we've knocked out the ascendant degree. We've knocked out planets in the ascendant. We've knocked out declinations to the ascendant and declination is literally not even rocket science. You just look over here, you find your ascendant, you see what the degree of the ascendant is in declination, and you see what the other, if there's any other factors within one degree on either side. 
In declination, we only use an orb of one degree. I, I'll put that down here, para que tu sepa, so that you're knowing. In declination, we only use a one degree orb. Who is this we that you speak of? I am the we. We only use a one degree orb. That's the size of the orb that we use at Oraculos. And we find that in declination, you don't have to stretch that wider because once again, if your chart is going to say something, it's going to say it in a bajillion million ways and you don't have to stretch, you know? It's not astro yoga, which is an inside joke. Okay, so we've done all of those things. And then the next thing that we wanna take a look at is we have checked off the ascendant, check. We've checked off the planets in the ascendant, check. We've checked off the aspects to the ascendant, is it not? Yes, we did that too. Now we do the ruler of the ascendant and we take the ruler of the ascendant through a similar spiel. So going back over here to the chart, <clears throat> Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. In traditional astrology, we use traditional rulerships and that's just it <laughs> in terms of that whole thing. In traditional astrology, we use traditional rulerships and there's, a, and there's a reason for that. And if you're unfamiliar or if you have had no satisfactory reason as to why that is, there is a video on my YouTube channel called why Saturn is the only ruler of Aquarius, which, you know, truthfully, it's a rather incendiary title, but it's a really good video and I think you'll like it. So if you could look beyond the title, watch the video and you'll like it a lot or your money back. Anyway, so where are we? The rule of the ascendant is Saturn. So we have the ruler. Actually, why am I doing it down there? I'm gonna send this to Eileen as well so that you're having the notes from this. And I guess you'll have the recording. I don't know, but you'll at least have the notes. So the ruler of the ascendant is Saturn. And Saturn in this chart is Saturn at four degrees. Piscus, zero, zero minutes. Saturn in Pisces is interesting. It's really, really, really interesting. And it's interesting for the reason that Sat, that, that Pisces of the water signs may be considered to be the most watery because Pisces being ruled by Jupiter is the expansion of the water element beyond boundaries. And so when we think about Pisces as being this expansive sign, it, it's less because of the Neptune connection to Pisces, which from a traditional astrology perspective, there really isn't one, but it's more because Jupiter as this expansive quality within the water element is already having a lack of boundaries within itself. And when you place that lack of boundaries within water, which by itself is already boundless, you create a sense of boundlessness. So Saturn and Pisces tends to be a pretty stressful combination when it is your chart ruler. There's a whole thing I could say about that, but it tends to be a, a stressful combination because the, the Saturnian impulse within the life of the native is to build, to erect, to solidify. But the Piscean impulse within the life of the native is to expand, to share, to give. And when you have those two things happening at the same time, what has the tendency of happening is that, oh me, oh my. And this person is also having Saturn in opposition with Chiron in the eighth house. I use Chiron. I'm a traditional astrologer, hard to the bone, and I use Chiron, you know, and that's the end of that. So this person is also having the Saturn in Pisces with the Chiron. So this is an interesting combination. And it can oftentimes be a very stressful combination for the reasons why Saturn in Pisces is already stressed insofar as it's taking on, Saturn is already gonna take on your obligations. Saturn in Pisces wants to take on the obligations of everyone, the birds, the trees, the people, the animals, the family members, the members of the family, the children around the world who are starving, the children who aren't starving, your children in general, that is kind of the thing. And so when we have the Saturn in Pisces, we have this, this increase of, this increase of burden 
on the shoulders of a person. It's a wonderful thing in terms of a humanitarian effect because of feeling so deeply and because of being so connected to that feeling nature, but those feelings end up becoming problematic for the very reason that it doesn't really allow the person to feel as if they're really standing on solid ground. Now, why is standing on solid ground going to be important to this person in any event? It's because the person has Capricorn rising and that Capricorn rising is already pressed. And the reason why it's already pressed is because Neptune is rising with that Capricorn as well as the Uranus. Now, something that we have to consider when we, when and if we choose to use a sign-based approach to astrology, which I'm not saying that is completely an incorrect approach to use, I'm saying it's an overused approach that people use. When we use a completely sign-based approach to astrology, we have to ask ourselves, how will this person respond to these effects? You understand? Because someone who is having an overture of Sagittarius in their chart will respond very differently to having Uranus parallel their ascendant versus someone who is having this excess of Capricorn in their chart or this excess of Saturn within their chart. So we consistently have to come back to the question of who has this chart because for the for the Sagittarian or for the Gemini person, they will revel in that Uranus rising and they will also revel in the Uranus parallel, the ascendant. Whereas for the person who is having the Capricorn rising, the Virgo rising, the Taurus rising, that is not having the same effect over there in terms of how that person interacts with the Uranus as a concept within their lives, you see? Virgo likes change, but it only likes change because change keeps on happening to it. It doesn't like change because it likes change. It likes change because it's forced into situations that are constantly changing, and therefore the Virgo is constantly having to fix the things that are changing. But Virgo is also, Virgo is the most fixed of the mutable signs. Similarly, Capricorn is the most fixed of the cardinal signs, and as we all know, Taurus is the most fixed of the earth signs. I'm moving back. Okay, <clears throat> so we've done all of these things, ruler of the ascendant, aspects of the ascendant, declination, blah, blah, and the hoorah. Now, what is the next piece? Ruler of the ascendant, we do the same things to the rule of the ascendant and aspects to the ruler. So the rule of the ascendant is Saturn. Now we do aspects to L1. L1 is Lord 1. L2 is Lord 2. L3, you guessed it, is Lord 3. So aspects of Lord 1. We're having Sun Saturn here. We have Sun Saturn for much the same reason why we have Moon Ascendant. We have the Sun Saturn because the Sun is having a wider orb. Another thing that should be known in traditional astrology is that the planets have orbs. Aspects don't have orbs. Planets have orbs. Aspects don't have orbs. A trine doesn't have, I actually really don't know what people say the trine has, but the trine isn't having an eight degree orb. The planets have an orb. And the reason for this is because that trine means diddly squat without the planets that form it. An orb is an aura of a planet. An aspect, which is an invisible point in space, has no aura. You have an aura as a human being. Your aspect doesn't have an aura. You are the one with the auric field. You understand? So this is, this is a conceptual shift. But it's an important one because we think that there is, a, within our modern perspective, and once again, I use Chiron, I use Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. I am modern AF. In our modern perspective, we have a tendency to think that the trine is this invisible point in space that's just waiting to be inhabited. We should change that because the trine doesn't exist without the ass, without the planet that casts that trine. So in traditional astrology, we hear these things about planets casting their rays. And from the sun, the sun is casting a 60 degree ray 
And if another planet meets that 60 degree ray, it is a sextile. It's casting a 90 degree ray. And if another planet is meeting that 90 degree ray, it's a square. It's casting a 120 degree ray. And if another planet is meeting that 120 degree ray, it is a trine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The aspects are born from the planets, not as a single thing within themselves. Anyway, we're moving back in. So that is that. So aspects to Lord One. So Saturn, we are having, we are having Saturn. We're having Saturn, O, O, sorry. We're having Sun, O, O, Saturn. Why? Because that's a Sun-Saturn conjunction. We can move on from that. I hold on to the number four and I rush around the chart. Four to the part of fortune. Mm. We'll note it because the Saturn is in the second house and the second house is already the house of money. So if Saturn is in a 60, to the POF, we continue to go on. Saturn to the node, no. Saturn, Chiron, most assuredly, yes. Saturn is having the 180 to the Chiron. Then we continue. Saturn to the Jupiter, no. Saturn to the moon, no. Saturn, no, 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 no. Nothing else is happening to the Saturn. Great. So now that we've done all of this, we're now in a place where we are ready to work this ascendant. That took a very long time. It usually doesn't take that long. The final thing we'll check is over here to see whether or not that Saturn is doing anything else. Saturn is at 11 degrees um, south declination and Mercury is at 11 degrees south declination. So we have, so we have Mercury parallel Saturn. That's great. And because our Chiron is so deeply involved with the Saturn by virtue of its literal almost exact opposition to the Saturn, and Chiron is reversed, which means it's, it's reversing back to the application of that opposition, we'll take a look at what the Chiron is doing. And here we see Chiron Venus, which is also going to be information. We have Chiron contra parallel to Venus. And I don't really have a symbol for contra parallel, so Chiron contra parallel to Venus. Now we are completely ready to dive in. So this serves as our backdrop that we will constantly come back and refer to as we go throughout the reading of the chart. This is the entire workup of who has this chart. Now I know there's 902, well, there's 902 in the Bahamas and so we have about 28 minutes left. I'll just show you these final uh, slides for what happens next and then we I'll just go and read the chart just so that you would have had the full opportunity to see the slides as well as to participate. So the ascendant. In Vedic astrology, the ascendant is called the lagna or that which ties the soul down. It contains the quantum of energy that we all have come into this world with and it is that energy that feeds the rest of the chart. So that's why we're so focused on the ascendant. Now the rising sign. The rising sign represents the persona or the mask through which the soul will express itself within the environment. The rising sign represents the persona or the mask through which the soul will express itself within the environment. I said earlier that the if you're casting a chart by hand, then your ascendant is pretty much taken from your local horizon for where you are, which means that there's a relationship between your ascendant and the environment that you're born into. And therefore, when we think about the ascendant as the persona or the mask that you wear within the environment, we have to realize that that ascendant is completely conditioned based on the environment. So the you who you are by virtue of the ascendant is the you who you've been taught to be by virtue of your living in the world. You see? So when we're looking for the true self of the person, that search has to take us elsewhere. But when we're looking for the person as they are conditioned to live and be within the world, we're specifically looking at that ascendant because the ascendant shows the conditioned personality, the conditioned mask that I have accrued onto myself as a, re as a relationship of my relationship to the world around me. Now, the element of the ascendant represents the chief operating system, which will be the primary means of expression. What is the chief thing within the heart of a Capricorn that wants to be expressed? It is the earth as the earth element. And then the next thing and the final thing <clears throat> is the mode. The mode is how will that element be expressed? 
So yes, you might be earth, but how are you expressing that earth? Are you expressing it in a cardinal way, a fixed way, or a mutable way? So let's go and do that much in terms of what we have thus far. So here we have this person as being a cardinal earth sign ruled by Saturn. Earth as the chief operating system within this person says that this person fundamentally wants to establish for themselves a sense of the practical, the pragmatic, the real, and the tangible within their lives. This is the chief operating system or the desire that this person is wanting to step forward into the world to acquire and to attain. Whether or not that happens is another thing entirely. Because we all might want to do something because that is our natal inclination based on the element of our ascendant. But whether or not the rest of the chart is in support of that thing that we're wanting to do is another thing entirely, you see? So the earth element operating through the Capricorn is wanting to have this sense of the stable, the fixed, the secure, the grounded, the real, the tangible underneath its feet. And because of those reasons, it makes the Capricorn native unwilling to really be shifted or unwilling to really be changed as a standalone factor of life because changes come and those changes seem to be antithetical to the stability that I'm trying to establish within my life. Those changes seem to be not within harmony to the sense of structure and the sense of security that I'm wanting to establish within my life. For the Capricorn person, we say that the Capricorns are builders because of this relationship to Earth. But the Capricorn person is the one who's going to make sure that the securities, those Earth-based securities, are established at the end of the day because those are the things that it needs in order to feel safe. Now, from the Earth, we go on to the mode. How does this express itself? The mode here is the cardinal mode, which the ancients call the movable mode. And Cardinal Earth in relationship to Capricorn says that it is going to initiate the things that allow it to find stability within this world. Or, because we know that we're talking about the Ascendant, the person will want or have the internal desire to initiate those things which represent stability and structure and security within this world. The other side of this is we will know how little or how much this is possible based on other factors within the chart. We already see the Neptune and the Uranus rising. We already see the Uranus, the Uranus parallel, the ascendant down here. So we already know that there were some fundamental difficulties in terms of establishing this within the early life for this person. However, for all intents and purposes, that is the desire that this person has to initiate things that represent stability, to initiate things that represent security, and to be the one who goes out and brings back into the household the things that allow everyone to be safe and the things that allow everyone to feel as if they are supported. And that support directly comes out of the fact that Capricorn, being the sign that begins the season of winter, is very much aware of what it means to be out in the cold. Capricorn being the sign that begins the season of winter is very much aware of what it means to ration and take care of itself and to live in the most frugal sort of way possible because of its relation because of where Capricorn is falling within the wheel of the year. And finally, it expresses this through this Saturn. This Saturn is going to be the impulse or is going to be the person who is expressing these energies or who is given the duty to fulfill the promise of this Capricorn. Saturn and Capricorn would have been able to do that in a lovely fashion, maybe even Saturn and Aquarius. But here we have Saturn and Pisces. And Pisces as a sign is as different from Capricorn as can be. And so what, we, what we've already established about the Saturnian thing is that there's a sense of taking on the needs of the world. There's a sense of taking on the burdens within the environment. There's a sense of wanting to obligate myself to others and wanting to take on the obligations of others, essentially, is what we see through the Saturn impact. And the fact that the Saturn is here in Pisces says that what clothing is that Saturn wearing? How is that Saturn dressed up for the fulfillment of its Saturnian role in life? And the clothing that that Saturn is wearing is the clothing of Pisces, and the Pisces clothing is one that is porous. 
when we think about Saturn, we think about boundaries because we think about Saturn as being the gatekeeper between the known world and the unknown worlds beyond Saturn of Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Chiron, the whole spiel. But when we think about Pisces, we think about a sense of porousness. So the boundaries that we find with the Saturn and Pisces native is a sense of porous boundaries where the boundaries aren't necessarily the strongest, they're not necessarily the most established, and this may be a thing that allows this person to move through the world feeling without skin, essentially. And I say without skin because Saturn is representing skin and animal skins and things that protect the outer body. And the Pisces element is a completely nebulous, watery component that allows this person to move through the world without skin. And that without skin component of the Pisces also ties into the central source of what may represent a point of wounding within the life of this person. We say a point of wounding within the life of this person because this person is also having Saturn in opposition to Chiron. And as we're all knowing, the Chironian story is the story of the quote unquote wounded healer for what that is worth. And so, when we have the chart ruler, which represents the body of the person, having this square aspect or having this oppositional aspect to Chiron, it can be a sense that I carry around this sensitivity within me as a constant source of, as a constant thing that requires me to be healed within the world, or as a constant source of me needing healing within the world, because I move through this world without skin, I move through this world without armor, and as a result of that, I feel everything in the world passes through me. And the Chiron impact only causes that to be a further more permeable sense of who I am, and a more further and more permeable sense of myself. Now, moving on from this, we have the next thing, which would have been our, let me just go back over to our rubric just to make sure that we're following that. So we, we didn't jump ahead because what we did was we spoke about the element of the ascendant. We spoke about the element of the ascendant and the mode of the ascendant. And the next thing should have been the ruler of the ascendant, just because those three things come together. Capricorn isn't just a cardinal earth sign. Capricorn is a cardinal earth sign ruled by Saturn. So those three things come as one packet of information, and we interpret those three things in that same way. Now, the next thing that we have is planets in the ascendant. And the planets in the ascendant here are going to be the Neptune and the Uranus. And the Neptune is already allowing us to feel as if there is a depth of sensitivity within this person that only furthers the information that we said about the Chiron, or that we said about the Saturn Chiron, that we said about the Saturn and Pisces. And the Neptune impact says that, as we all know, the Neptune is giving this person a sense of a sense of the dream state, or it's giving this person a sense of the non-tangible realities in life that actually serve as the underpinnings of life. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive because Capricorn doesn't want no non-tangibles. Capricorn wants everything very, very tangible. So within the very tangible parameters of what this person is wanting to establish within the world, it's fueled by the sense of the dream state. It's fueled by the sense of the depth of the imagination. It's fueled by this richness of the non-tangible parts of this person that causes them to move through the world with their feeling nature. Now, that's all fine and dandy. And at the same time, Neptune, Uranus together for a Capricorn is not necessarily the most stabilizing energy within the world. The Neptune-Uranus combination gives the person extraordinary insightfulness in terms of their creative process, extraordinarily, extraordinary insightfulness in terms of being able to find the solution to things. And at the same time, it's a very stressful situation because it's like even the bed within which I sleep calls in the lightning. It's as if my, my, my mind is operating in such a high way that even the bed that I find myself on, it calls in this, this thing of instability or this thing of insomnia or this thing of staying awake or this thing of not necessarily being able to take rest. 
wonderfully insightful, wonderfully ingenious. Those are the things that we know about the Neptune and the Uranus, but Neptune and Uranus to Capricorn is more of, it, it's, it's an edginess and it causes the person to kind of be on the edge of their seat for all intents and purposes. Now, the next thing that I would naturally do just because it's what I do is I would look to see when would that ascendant have come to that Neptune and have come to that Uranus just by movement. And the movement that I tend to prefer is solar arc direction. And the concept of solar arc direction, even though it's used a lot in the modern time, it's not necessarily just a modern concept. This concept of the day being sacred is something that goes as far back as ancient Judaism and even beyond, that the day is a sacred measure of time or that the movement of the sun is a sacred measure of time. So by solar arc direction, this, this ascendant would have come, this 14 Capricorn would have come to this Neptune at 14 plus six is my 20, 20, 20, 21, 22. So that's six, seven, eight. So that would have been at the age of eight years old, would have been a major disillusionment within the environment of that person, as in a major lack of stability occurring within the environment of this person around the age of eight years old, when the ascendant comes to the Neptune, but also the ascendant coming to the Uranus, eight, nine, 10, at 10 years old, would have been a major breaking apart that also happens within that environmental space. Now, when we think about children and just what that means within the lives of children, there are several things that that can be. One of them is there could be a major move that happens that is completely destabilizing to me, or there is a divorce that happens within the family that is completely destabilizing to me. Yeah. So that would be how I would take a look at that by virtue of moving that through time to see when does this person inherit this depth of sensitivity that they now have and that they're now using as they move within the world. Because that's going to be an important thing for us to know. It isn't just enough for us to say that, oh, you're sensitive. But when did that inheritance of sensitivity occur? And that would be, those would be my initial impressions around the age of, I think I said, eight and then around the age of 10. Yes, eight and 10. So that is that in terms of planets in the ascendant. Now, the next thing that we look at, and we're at 917, so we're rushing against the clock, but I'm gonna wrap this up so that we could end on the, and we, I think we have about 15 more minutes left, but then after that, we'll do the great reveal, whoever's chart this is, you can speak up and let us know whether or not this landed for you. Now, <clears throat> And so everything we saw about the Neptune and Uranus goes back to corroborate the fact that by declination, the Uranus is parallel the ascendant, which means that there are breakages that occur within my environment and those breakages may occur very early on within life. But as a result of those breakages, I myself, as I move through the world, I find myself becoming this Uranian type of person where I'm not necessarily wanting to have a deep sense of permanence in terms of my own connections or in terms of my own relationship spaces because I'm accustomed to relationship spaces and I'm accustomed to breakage as a concept already. So don't hold me down because I know what happens when people try to get, when people try to be hold down, people get hurt essentially is the Uranus ascendant thing. But it also makes this person a good astrologer, which isn't just me blowing air up anyone's behind. Uranus is from a modern perspective and also from a Uranian astrology perspective, the planet of the astrologer, which is lovely because the Uranus is also with the moon. Now, the next thing that we have going on here after we take a look at the planets that are in the ascendant and the declination, we have the aspects to the ascendant. Now we have the Sun sextile the Ascendant, Jupiter sextile the Ascendant, Moon sextile the Ascendant, we have a lot of sextiles, Moon sextile the Ascendant as well as Moon and Pluto sextiling the Ascendant as one unified body. So we could read that as what is the planetary effect of Sun sextiling the Ascendant or we could also read this as what is the effect of having the ruler of this person's eighth house sextiling that ascendant? Two sides of the same coin. 
the traditional astrology perspective is to take this sun as the ruler of this person's eighth house, in which case we know that from a, tradi from a traditional perspective, the eighth house is ruling over death, debt, finances, other people's finances, joint finances that we have from other people, but it's also the house of inheritance. And then so far as it's the house of inheritance, one of the things that we can say by virtue of the sex style, since the sex style is a good aspect, is that here is a person who inherits from their ancestors. So is it that death is happening within the life of this person and by virtue of the death that occurs within the life of this person, this person therefore receives inheritance and that inheritance is what supports their life? That's a question. Now, why... Whenever you ask any question astrologically, the next thing you have to ask is why? Why the hell would someone need to be supported in terms of an inheritance? Like what does, what, why is really the main thing? Why would that need to even be a thing? And one of the things that we see here as to that why is because regardless of Saturn being the ruler of the second house, Saturn in traditional astrology, rules Aquarius and it rules Capricorn. There's a reason for that. Go watch the video if you like. Saturn in Pisces also isn't having the strongest amount of dignity, essential dignity. And that's something that we haven't really gone into this evening, but it's something very much worth going into at some point in time because essential dignity is the bread and the butter and the entire skeleton of traditional astrology. So the fact that Saturn isn't necessarily having the most amount of essential dignity in this second house, and that Mars also isn't having the most amount of essential dignity in Aquarius, and that the sun isn't having the most amount of essential dignity in Pisces. The only thing here in this second house that's really dignified is the Venus. But here we see malefic Mars, malefic Saturn, and the sun outside of its own dignity is cannot be considered to be a benefit planet. So we even have malefic sun here. So we have finances, finances, i.e. second house finances. Oh, and then we also say the Mercury was in the second house as well. Mercury is very much in the second house by virtue of the five degree rule, which I told you at the beginning of the class workshop, when the planet is within five degrees of a house cusp, that planet is technically inhabiting that house. So we have quote unquote malefic Mars, quote unquote malefic Saturn, Sun not doing too well, Venus being the only thing that's doing well, Mercury in the second house retrograde, this person has money on their mind for all intents and purposes. And so the reason why we even came to this money situation is because what we said was, what did we say? What we said was the sun, yes. Sun being ruler of the eighth house in sextile to the ascendant, is saying to us that possibly money that comes as a result of death is something that supports this person within their life or inheritance that this person receives is something that supports this person within their life. These are two of the things that we would have said about this sun sextiling the ascendant situation. Now, the other thing with sun sextiling the ascendant could be that this is a person for whatever regardless of all the things that we've said thus far about the Capricorn and the Saturn and the Pisces, this is a person who still tries to shine benevolently within their environment and they want to give back, they want to be of service, they want for people, they want to have a wide open heart from which they can help other people around them. Now, so we looked at Sun as ruler of the eighth house, death, money by death, inheritance supports the life of this person and we also looked at this by virtue of sun by itself what does the sun represent sun represents the heart and the body sun represents magnanimousness and so here we have this person being an open-hearted person expressing themselves in the world in an open-hearted way and we've already spoken about how that open-heartedness impacts them as a as a life factor in general now the next thing after that that we have is we have jupiter in sextile aspect to the ascendant as well. Now Jupiter is here in the 10th house and it's retrograde. And if and the Jupiter in this chart is ruling the, the 11th house, it's also ruling the 12th house. So Jupiter in sextile aspect to the ascendant, retrograde and in Scorpio, retrograde, is saying that the friends of this person 
friends, and we say friends because we're talking about the 11th house, the friends of this person are also having a major impact within the environment of the person. And what about those friends? We have Jupiter ruling the 11th house as well as the 12th house. The 12th house from a traditional perspective is the house of our hidden enemies. And Guido Bonazzi in the 13th century says that your hidden enemies are those friends who smile in your face and stab you in your back, pretty much. And so here we have this connection between the friends that I keep as well as the people who probably don't have the very best, my very best interest at heart, and those people having a very great deal of impact within my environment. That is a one standalone factor. The other thing about the Jupiter by itself as in the planet, not the ruler of houses, but Jupiter as a planet is saying that it's confirming or giving us further corroboration that this person is coming from an environment that supports them financially. Now, this is important because here we see with the Saturn in the second house that this person's own financial ability to support themselves may potentially be, may potentially be a little bit precarious. And there can be many reasons for that. But the main thing is that there is support from the environment financially that this person is receiving, which we would have already said when we spoke about this person being supported in terms of the finances, um, this person being supported, period, in that sort of way, by inheritance from their ancestors, by money that they receive from death, all of those things. And now, finally, the moon here in this, the moon here also having the sextile relationship to the ascendant and ruling this person's seventh house. And this is the last place we'll go because I realized that we've, um, that we're, we only have four minutes left. But the moon here doing the same thing in terms of its sextile to the ascendant is saying that whatever this moon represents is going to be something that is not only of great importance within the life of this person, i.e. this person has moon and moon and north node, and whatever is touching the North Node in your chart is elevated within your life. So that's one indication of that moon, but also the moon is ruling this person's seventh house. And the rulership of the moon over this person's seventh house has to do with this person's love relationships. The moon is in Scorpio. And the moon in Scorpio, as we know, isn't necessarily having the greatest day in the sun because the moon in Scorpio is another one of these things similar to Pisces where the where it feels a lot and one of the feelings that it tends to gravitate towards moon and Scorpio as well as moon Pluto conjunction one of the feelings that it tends to gravitate towards more than other feelings is feelings of PG-13 feelings of depth a little bit more beyond PG-13, feelings of quote-unquote pain, or a sense that there is, um, there is a fundamental Plutonian story of pain and isolation that's tied up within the heritage and the family that I come from, family because we use the moon as a significator of family. So there's a fundamental Plutonian story of pain and great transformation that's tied up within the family that I come from. And that story is something that impacts me greatly within the context of my life. So when we talk about people in their families being the bearer of the quote unquote story of the story of the stuff, the 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 stuff that we don't necessarily like to talk about going on within the family, this person is the person who receives that and this person is the person who is essentially holding that family I don't necessarily like the term family trauma, but this person is the person who's holding that family story within themselves as they move within the world by virtue of the moon Pluto as a standalone factor. But if we take into consideration the fact that this moon is also ruling this person's seventh house, and what we end up with is that the moon ruling the seventh house is also having something to do with the, the love connections that this person finds themselves attracted to. And those love connections that they find themselves attracted to are love connections that may go hot and heavy and deep and intensely. But the hot, heavy depth and intensity of that moon 
with the Pluto sextiling the Ascendant could indicate that even these love connections that I find myself attaching myself to, there's a story of pain connected there, or there may be a story of trauma connected there. And as a result of that, I find that this love is one of the major crosses that I have to bear within my life. Because as I look within the story of my love situation, to figure out WTF is going on, what I find there is even a furthering of this thing that may have occurred very early on within my life, within the context of my family, that possibly caused me to feel this sense of moon Pluto isolation, which is also tied up with the Venus Chiron story. Now, stories like this make phenomenal healers. Stories like this make phenomenal astrologers because these people have the ability to be with all of that stuff, all of that humanity, and all of all of that rawness of the human experience. And they know how to navigate those waters because they have first figured out how to navigate those waters for themselves. And so when we look at any chart and we see, oh, wow, this thing has happened or that thing has happened, or look at all these things that are occurring within the life of this person, we can't ever forget that within the context of your horoscope, your natal chart, your vital sphere, whatever you choose to call it, we all go through the things that we go through, but we have an, we have an entire lifetime to work those things out. And insofar as we have an entire lifetime to work those things out, something that may sound like a dramatic statement in this moment, as I'm saying it in this very disconnected, objective sort of way, becomes something that that person ultimately ends up understanding about their own lives, understanding about their own family dynamic, and ultimately it becomes a source of strength and a source of healing and a source of beauty and of profundity within their lives. So we didn't do the whole run up. I tried to fit a four month program in the space of 90 minutes, but that is the that is the, the, the basic framework or backdrop for how that process would be done. Okay. So uh, whose chart is this? I'm good. How are you? Thank I'm you doing so much for that reading. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. You can tell us on a scale of one to 10, where a 10 being accurate, one being, what the fuck was that? Um, tell us where did that fall, for you, where did that land for you? Um, I definitely resonated that, um, up towards the 10 level, I would say. Okay. Awesome. So would you, would you, and thank you for that. And also thank you for being willing to step forward into this sort of space. Uh, would you be willing to give us any sort of contacts at all for, for some of the things I said? Yeah, I definitely resonated with what you were talking about um, in terms of the Capricorn, the intense need to kind of stabilize and um, find something tangible and be responsible. And then that being very strongly opposed to the dreamy, um, wanting to do everything and be everything, um, kind of artistic, that I find those very, very strong um, comparisons in my life. Um, and then also, I really resonated, I never thought of the moon as being in my seventh house before, but having that, what you said about the Venus and the Chiron, and just like the kind of pain with relationships, kind of feeling like an identity, um, that really hit me pretty strongly as well. Okay. And, and there was a piece there, as, and thank you for that, Shannon. There was a piece there about the, the inheritance piece. Did any of that make sense for you at all? Yes, that, that's actually something I haven't thought about before. So that was very interesting. Um, but I, I feel very supported um, from my parents and my, my upbringing um, and just feeling very secure financially. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never seen that in my chart before. So that was that was very interesting to to hear about. Okay, and then the the other thing in terms of I called off some ages, and one of the ages that I called off was um, was I think eight years old and ten years old. Does that range mean anything significant within your life? 
it doesn't, but that's something that I'd have to think about. Okay. But not off the top of my head. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. And let me just stop the share and come back over to here. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. This that we're doing this evening was something definitely brought up to you by the Oracle School of Astrology. And it's also something that Eileen specifically wanted me to dive into. And because of Eileen, I'm starting back up our masterclass series. And it's all going to be based on this that we did tonight, traditional approaches to psychological astrology. It'll be a 12 week series. So what we weren't able to do tonight, we'll hash out in 12 weeks and it will be every Sunday starting March 21st. And so if you learned anything or if you have questions from tonight that you know you, you really want to dive more deeply into some of the methodology here, knowing that I really couldn't do everything that I would have wanted to do, but we did a lot, then please do go over to our website at www.oraculosastrology.com. And I really so deeply look forward to seeing all of you in our traditional approaches to, psycho to psychological astrology 12-week masterclass series inspired by none other than Eileen Liu. Okay. Give me too much credit, Michael. <laughs> okay, so questions. <clears throat> yes, so um, scrolling all the way up to the top, we did have a curious inquiry about um, why Regimontanus? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought about that and Reggio Montanus, because Reggio Montanus is the house system of the Renaissance period. Insofar as we are practicing Renaissance astrology, we use Reggio Montanus because Reggio Montanus was used extensively throughout the 17th century. If you're practicing astrology from a particular period in time, you use the house system that's most appropriate for that period. So because I specialize in the astrology of Jean-Baptiste Mohan, I use the methods outlined by Jean Baptiste in the 17th century, and those methods go along with the house system that he was using at the time, which was Reggio Montanus. But also, I'm a Lily astrologer and a Gadbury astrologer and a Ramsey astrologer, and this and these astrologers who all wrote within the, the year 1600 to 1700 were all using Reggio Montanus, at least the ones who I reference. If we go back a little bit later, maybe we'd use Alcobicius, you know? So. Great. Um, Alex says, thank you, love that rationale. Yay, Alex. Alex, I hope you can make it to the Masterclass series. I really look forward to seeing you there. Okay, next question. Next question, can you define uh, what parallels are? Oi. Okay, so. You have the equator, period. You have the, let me, let me go back to speaker view so everyone can see. You have the equator. If two planets are above the equator, sharing the same degree in declination. So you call, you measurement above and below the equator is called declination. When the equator is the reference point, measurement, north and south of the equator is called declination. So two planets sharing the same declination north of the equator are parallel. Two planets sharing the same declination south of the equator are parallel. And if one planet is at 10 degrees south declination and another planet is at 10 degrees north declination, that is called a contra parallel. A parallel is seen as being the same as a conjunction. A contra parallel is seen as being the same as the as an opposition. But technically, for me, as a Uranian astrologer and as a midpoint person as well, conjunctions and oppositions all mean the same thing in my book. What is important is the planets that make those aspects, not the type of aspects they make. But that's another topic for another day. And but I hopefully I answered your question about the parallel situation. Those were the two technical questions. And then we had just one other, which was um, if you could elaborate a little bit more about Chiron and how that fits into the money story that the chart describes. 
you know, the Chiron situation is having to do with Chiron is a baby Saturn. I posted that on Twitter and I believe it to be true. Chiron is a baby Saturn. And when your Saturn gets Saturned by baby Saturn, <laughs> it's intense, it's pressure. And what it means is that Saturn becomes even a bigger issue within your life in terms of how you navigate your relationship to the world around you. And I mean, that's kind of all that means. You know, Saturn is in the, Saturn is in the second house. So this person's Saturn return is going to happen when Saturn is at four degrees Pisces, which is going to bring up this Saturn Chiron story again. And at that time, it's probably going to be like, what have you done in terms of your finances? What stability have you made for yourself in terms of your financial world? How have you really attended to, how have you really attended to the stabilization of your financial life? Because you already have the Saturn and Pisces, which is interesting. And you also have the, you already, you also have the Saturn Chiron, which is also interesting. So how can we, uh, upon that Saturn return, take care of the, the story or the fundamental lesson that is central to our lives in terms of how we support ourselves. Yes, we saw many things within the chart that showed how I'm supported by my environment, but the Saturn Chiron story and all of the other things is saying, now how do I actively turn that into a sense of support for myself? Which is a good thing, it's a good question to ask at any age, but it's definitely the question that gets super highlighted with the Saturn and the Chiron. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I guess I'm trying to place uh, Chiron in charts and, uh, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I'm not sure, you know, how, much, how a freestanding Chiron operates say not does it only operate when it's conflicting some other planet or is if it's freestanding and unexpected is it relevant i love the fact that you said when it's inflicting <laughs> i love the fact that you said when it's inflicting another planet that's exactly what chiron does it inflicts other planets uh but what i what i want to say is things like <laughs> oh okay jason the I'm doing a moon Saturn, I'm doing a moon Chiron research and it's an intense research. And moon Chiron always has to do with the mother as a source of Chiron insofar as my research has led me to believe at this moment. Every time someone comes and talks about them having moon Chiron, it's it's always along the lines of, and once again, this doesn't necessarily, oh, well, there you go. And so what was I gonna say about moon Chiron? Every time when someone talks to me about Chir moon Chiron, it's always, you know, my mom really wasn't the most stable source in my life. Mom was a source of isolation. Mom was a little bit crazy. Mom was a lot of bit crazy. Mom told us that she was going to kill herself. She didn't kill herself. She was just doing it for attention. There's always a, there's always a story when there's a moon. Kyra Oive, it's out of bounds and it's in Gemini. Well, you know, hope springs eternal. You have your entire life to figure that out. And that's my final hot take on that. Now, next, Eileen. <laughs> uh, those are all the questions from the chat, at least unless I've missed anyone, so. Yay. Did you all enjoy this at least a little bit? <laughs> like a tiny piece. <laughs> okay, I see Jill clapping. I'm appreciative of Jill's claps and the Oraculos people. The Oraculos people, you have to love me because you don't have a choice. But <clears throat> thank you all so much. I'm super down to sit around and talk if you like. But if you do have to tap out, I understand. Sunny also says that they loved this very much, but that was a direct message to me accidentally. Awesome sauce. 
Thank you so much for coming to this workshop. Please do check on my website. Please, please, please do join the masterclass series. It's lovely to do that. And it's lovely to do it with a lot of people. And I definitely want to do it with all of you. It's $25 per class, the masterclass. And you can't really beat that with a stick. So please do check out the masterclass series. And we also have a rate for if you want to do all 12 of them. I would love to have you there because it's only going to be a further continuation of what we did this evening. My website is www.oraculosastrology.com.